Welcome, good afternoon. My name is Gaiman Yi. Uh, and welcome again to, uh, to another i for energy seminar. We have a, a good talk today. Uh, in fact, uh, two speakers today. Uh, we have, um, first of all, Therese Peffer. Uh, she is a research coordinator at the California Institute for Energy, energy and Environment. She's a colleague of mine. Um, her current research focus is on uh, on energy consumption displays, thermostats, and consumer behavior, and other user interface usability research. Um, you probably have seen her before, because she uh, normally uh, does the introductions uh, when I'm not available. Anyway, as an architect, uh, Therese has worked in uh, small firms in San Francisco and at uh, Pismo Beach. She has a BA in neurobiology and psychology from UC Berkeley a uh, master's degree in architecture from the University of Oregon and a PhD in architecture back here in, in UC Berkeley. Um, her co-speaker today is uh, Domenico Caramagno. He is the facilities manager of this building. So now you know if, uh, if you feel uncomfortable, you know, he's the guy to, to go talk to. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, he, previously, he was the superintendent of the UC Berkeley's Richmond Field Station. Uh, where he monitored and analyzed energy and water consumption for over 20 buildings and labs. And before that, he was a facility specialist uh, within the College of Natural Resources, where he managed the day-to-day -day, uh, operations uh, of Mulford, Wellman, and Hilgard Halls. Um, Domenico holds a BS degree in forestry from UC Berkeley. So uh, let's welcome the two speakers today, and uh, I think Domenico is going to start off. All right. Thank you, Gaiman. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I hope I'm a familiar face for most of you in this, uh, in this audience here as I'm the building manager. You probably see me roaming around the building. Uh, what I hope to talk a little bit about today and help you guys get a better understanding of um, the Distributed Intelligent Demand Response Project here in Sitarzadai Hall. It's a project that is a collaboration funded through the Department of Energy, and it's a collaboration with um, some citrus faculty here on the, in, in Sitar's Dai, as well as Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories and Siemens Corporate Research. Um, to start with, I wanted to say, uh, just talk a little bit about what is demand response. I think we've heard this term a lot, but demand response is more or less energy load reduction during times of peak demand, often compensated by the utility provider um, through some financial incentives. So. I don't pay the utility bill, or Citrus does not pay the utility bill for Sitar Jedi Hall. It is a campus um, depart you know, campus is billed for the whole university. So for this project, there's not any specific financial incentives, but um, there are obviously incentives for the university to look at reducing peak demand in buildings. Uh, and it's different, demand response is different than energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is looking at continuous um, Con, you know, reducing consumption continuously in buildings. And um, as we are looking into those types of areas here in Stars at I Hall, this demand response project is looking at specifically shedding load during, during um, demand response events. So one of the main goals of the project is to reduce peak demand in Stars at I Hall by 30% while maintaining a comfortable, productive, and health, healthy um, environment for our occupants. We could shut off the lights, shut off the HVAC systems, and everybody would just leave the building. Yeah, we'd save a bunch of energy, but we're still not, you know, pursuing the mission of the university, which is uh, conducting research. So um, we want to maintain a productive environment while we're doing that. And uh, we look at it in two different ways. There's central loads, and there's distributed loads here on the, in the building that we want to be able to control. So the central loads that we're looking at are our cooling systems, our chilled water system, our supply air systems with our fan walls, um, pumps. There's a number of systems that support the Marvell Nano Lab that we'll talk about briefly, as well as distributed loads. So throughout the building, we have our plug loads and we have our light loads. How are we going to be able to communicate with those loads and shed some of those um, some of those loads during demand response events? So what I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about where we started and where we're going, and then Therese will talk more about the. Uh, methodologies and some more of the specifics on the research that's going on here within this project. So Sitar Jedi Hall was completed uh, May 2000, or the substantial completion was May 27th, 2009. Uh, the project cost was $176 million. 
uh, total square feet of Sutar's die is 141,000. And about 80,000 of that is office space, and 15,000 of that is clean room space within the Marvell Nano Lab, which is a class 100 and class 1000 clean room. What most of you might not know is that in the basement of Sutar's die hall, we have a main distribution center. So a lot of the uh, telecommunication infrastructure for this northeast corner of campus is um, routed through the basement of Sutar Sutarsai Hall. It used to be in Evans Hall. Evans is rated seismically poor, so during construction of Sutar to Die, they decided, how about we move some of that infrastructure into a seismically safe building, and we'll, we'll be better off uh, in the future. So that's a, a fairly substantial load within the building. The building has a Siemens Apogee control system. So Siemens controls operate everything from opening our economizer dancers to stampers to staging our chillers and, and whatnot. And we also have a Siemens energy management system within the building. So this is a profile within the month of October of our building load. Um, we're right around about a 900 uh, kilowatt base load. You see that day there in October, that was Monday uh, the 17th at 4 p.m. We were right around you know, uh, 1.1 megawatts. And it was around 81 degrees that day. So as you can see, I mean, just through, these, through this profile, you can kind of see where, um, you know, these are the weekends. This is Monday when it was pretty hot and there was a, a substantial um, demand on the grid from our building. So this is a profile of Sutar to Die just for one month in October. And this is how it compares to some other buildings here on campus. Uh, so we're 141,000 square feet. We're, we're approaching um, a base load of right around a megawatt. And then you have Stanley Hall that's 285,000 square feet, and that's right about one and a half megawatts. And the VL Valley Life Science Building is, you know, a megawatt. And then Worcester Hall is right around uh, 150 kilowatts. So that's how we compare. What's drawing these loads in Sudar Zadai Hall? And I just wanted to put this slide up here, not to show all the different flows and systems, but just to show that there's a fairly complicated series of chilled water systems um, HVAC systems, airflow systems, hot water systems. This is just showing the chilled water and the uh, condenser water for Sutard's Die Hall. So we have things, we have three different chillers in the building, we have a series of condenser water pumps, we have a series of chilled water pumps, fan walls, not to include all the lab support systems, the process systems within the Marvel Nano Lab, the D, uh, reverse osmosis deionized water system. So these are all some of the things that are contributing to that, you know, base load of right around 900 uh, kilowatts. The Siemens Apogee building automation system controls uh, a lot of, or the majority of sense points that we have within the building. And a lot of those controls are based off of inputs as outside air temperature, chilled water supply temperatures, um, air handler supply air temperatures and whatnot. So, there's ways where we can interface with the control system. So I have the control system in my office. If I want to adjust the temperature in this auditorium, I have the capability to do that. But part of this research project is looking at how do we interface to the Siemens Apogee system and not have to go through Siemens stovepipe proprietary <laughs> interface that I have access to in my office and a number of other users have access to, but it still is a kind of client-based proprietary system. So we're looking at ways to do that, and one of the ways is through uh, a BACnet um, interface that allows us to pull and collect data from the Siemens Apogee system as well as um, control some of the points within the system. And there's roughly uh, about 15 different um, control panels throughout the building, and all of the different sense points, whether it's from air handlers or chilled water systems, are uh, feeding into these different control panels that are spread out throughout all seven floors of Sutar to Die. So another substantial load in the building is our chilled water system. Um, as I mentioned, there's systems that support strictly the Marvell Nano Lab, and there's systems that support only the office side, and then there's some systems that support both. And our chilled water system is one of them. So we have two 600-ton chillers. We have a centrifugal chiller, and we have a steam absorption chiller. The idea behind the design here is that uh, in the warmer, um, warmer summer months, we would run our steam absorption chiller, which uses waste heat from the central cogen plant on campus and, to produce cooling. And then in the 
colder winter months when there's more demand from that steam, that central steam on campus to heat buildings, we'd use our centrifugal chiller that uses electricity to compress refrigerant, heat it up, and go through a, a heat exchange cycle to produce cooling for both the lab and the office. We have a third smaller chiller. I didn't include it on the slide, but it's a little um, multi-stack chiller that provides cooling to that main distribution center, that telecom um, hub that's in the first floor of our building. And um, that's more or less a standalone system that's strictly for that main distribution center. So the campus cogent plant, where does our steam come from? Um, it's a plant located right off of uh, Evans Field by Haas Pavilion. I'm sure many of you have seen the building there. It's a uh, 25 megawatt gas turbine generator. The campus base load is roughly, um, I'm sorry, this slide's actually incorrect. The, it's a 16 megawatt gas turbine generator. The campus base load is roughly 25 megawatts. So we don't have enough, um, we can't supply enough electricity to meet the campus load, but we do have enough thermal load to uh, meet a lot of the campus needs. And then because we have this cogen plant on campus, we get a discounted rate on our electricity. Our, our utility rate is the E20T rate. Where we're paying roughly about eight cents for a kilowatt hour. And that's due to um, a, a, an agreement or a contract that we have with PHE that we run this, uh, this cogeneration plant. And so the idea here is that in the summer months when we wouldn't really use a lot of that waste heat from the cogen plant to heat buildings, we could use that waste heat from the cogen plant to cool buildings like Sutar Sudai Hall that has a, a steam absorption chiller. So this is a plot just showing the chiller demand in October. And as you can see, it uh, fluctuates greatly. Um, part of that is due to a, a common problem, I guess, with buildings of over-engineering, over-designing chillers. So our chilled water system is, uh, I would say, significantly over-engineered. We have a 600-ton chiller, and we're using roughly 150 watts. So like your, your, your car at home, when you drive, your car likes to be driven on the freeway at 60 miles an hour you know, from here to LA. If it could do that, it's going to run more efficiently than driving around Berkeley, stopping and going. Our chiller running at 20%, which is more or less the, the lowest load that we've seen our chiller perform without shutting off, it runs at 20% and will um, turn on and shut off uh, frequently, causing these, these huge peaks and spikes in, our, uh, in demand on the, uh, on the grid. You see that, that uh, drop there right around the uh, 17th of, um, of October, and that's when we actually turned on our steam absorption chiller. So this plot here shows uh, the steam demand um, in the building after the uh, absorber ran. So again, there's some trade-offs between running each of these chillers. And we're, we have a unique situation where, yeah, we can save energy um, looking at the chillers, but looking at the whole systems, all the systems that supply the cooling to the building, the chilled water pumps, the condenser water pumps. Um, when you look at the entire system, uh, there's, there's some trade-offs between there. And one of them is we're using much more steam when we're running the steam absorption chiller. And yeah, as f you know, we might look at that steam for free. Campus is giving it to us, but obviously there's a cost to run the, uh, the cogen plant down there by, um, by Evans Field. The Marvel Nano Lab is another um, significant load in Sutar Jedi Hall. I just wanted to show this slide um, because we'll never see the lab like this again. This is before fit out of the lab. This is right after construction. We're looking in a service bay here. And what I wanted to point out, you can't probably really see it, I'll zoom in in a second, is there's many utilities that go to the, uh, the Marvel Nano Lab. Obviously, all those utilities drawing um, a significant portion of the load here in Sutar Jedi. The um, exhaust ducts right here. There's exhaust ducts now that are connected to multiple tools that are used inside of that, uh, inside of that lab. There's all these process utilities, deionized water, as I can zoom in here. What I wanted to show was there's also this, um, this drain system, which basically all the waste that comes out of the lab goes to an acid waste neutralization system. All that acid waste is then treated before it goes down the drain um, at a pH that's acceptable to the city. So as you zoom in here, I'm not sure if everybody can see this, but we have process cooling water, you know, retire, uh, supply and return. We have process vacuum, potable water. We have compressed uh, dry air. We have um, deionized water up on top. So there's all these systems that are located in the basement of Sitar Jedi Hall, rooms that many of us, uh, or I'm sure many of you haven't seen before, where there's many systems that are um, operating in this building. And those are all um, creating some challenges with, with the, the goal of the DIADR project to reduce, you know, consumption in Stars and I Hall by 30%, which is a pretty ambitious goal, but we're working towards it. 
So the Marvell Nano Lab. Here is a plot um, of of the demand in the Nano Lab, both looking at tool load and looking at uh, at HVAC system. So you can see this drop here right around the same 17th of, uh, of October was when we transferred from our centrifugal chiller to our steam absorption chiller and that um, reduced some of the load in the building and as you can see this kind of tool load in the lab as the, lo as the lab has been growing and uh, moving in the, uh, the load, the tool load in the lab has been gradually increasing. Another challenge here in the building is that the building was designed with a reheat system. And what that means is that we're taking outside air, we're running it through a series of, of filters, and then we're cooling the air with this cooling coil here, and then we're reheating the air by the time it comes to the office level. So there's a couple of advantages to this. We have economizer dampers which can open up on days when the outside air temperature is um, within certain bounds and we can use that cold outside air to um, reduce the load on our chiller. But then on hot days, these economizer dampers would close. These always remain open to allow the minimum amount of outside air to come into the building. And uh, we still process that air through here and then we reheat it at the zone level being the auditorium or a specific office level or a collaboratory level with a VAV box. So this is a typical VAV box where we have that 56 degree um, supply air coming in here. We have a damper position to control the volume of the air going through. And then we have this heating coil which then reheats the air into the office space. And this is a typical VAV that's branched out to you know four different uh, um, air diffusers within an office or within a, uh, within a space. So that pr that this problem here has some challenges where you would think oh, for demand response we'll just increase the air temperature to from 70 to 75 degrees. But there's some trade-offs with that. As you increase the air, these valves open up, there's more steam demand on campus, we have to keep that water hot, and we're actually using more steam to produce these, these warmer office air temperatures. And then as you cool things, the fan speed increases because you're actually sending more volume of air into the space to cool it. So again, there's all these trade-offs between increasing chiller load and reducing fan speed or increasing fan speed and reducing chiller load and we're looking right now on how we can uh, can optimize that. So a lot of the data that I show here comes from some submetering that we've installed in the building since construction. Uh, back in uh, May 2009 when the building was complete we had um, five submeters in the building looking at total building load, water, and steam use. And I guess we had four submeters. We had two for Two for the building load, one for water, one for steam, and I thought there was a fifth one. But now we've, um, since 2009, Citrus has invested over $200,000 in additional submeters to uh, provide us with some of the data that I've showed you here and provide the DI-ADR project with some of the data to uh, start running models and getting a better understanding of how Sitar's die operates. So um, now we have a ser series of submeters that are looking at light loads and plug loads per floor. We're looking at HVAC systems. Uh, server room loads, office air handler systems, and um, over 700 sense points coming from the BAS system that we're now actually pulling through this BACnet interface. And these 700 sense points are all part of the uh, building automation system. So all of this data is going to uh, a, few different, a few different places, and I'll talk about that in a minute here. But um, what we also have is in the basement of our building, we have this double-ended 200 kVA uh, substation that each end of this substation has the capacity for roughly about 4,000 amps. Um, this line diagram here shows all these yellow boxes are metered breakers and they're um, large 600 to 800 amp breakers that we're metering. They're then metering systems such as the, uh, the process equipment for the lab, um, air handlers and hot water pumps, we're looking at other air handler systems and exhaust fans, um, elevators and things like that. So we're looking at groups of systems that we, are, we have kind of um, total submeters for. So we still need more granular data. This was the first phase of submeters. We're gonna add some additional submeters into the building um, and those projects are actually right around the corner looking, uh, hopefully in December, we'll start installing our second phase of, of submeters into Sitar Jedi. But now we have all these submeters and we have data like this. So this plot is showing the, um, 
third floor lighting data back in April 2011. So Monday through Friday, we have this lighting data. I was looking at it back then and saying, what's causing all these, these you know, short spikes in our, in our light load? And this is one, or this is five days. Here's one day. And it turns out the culprit's the electric hot water heaters that we have throughout our building. These little, um, these little guys, these electric hot water heaters take 277 volts, so they're connected to the same panels as our 277 volt lighting system. And we have four of them per floor, one in each of the restrooms, the men and the women's restrooms. We have them in the custodial closets for the mop um, sinks, and then we also have them in our pantries for our, uh, for our pantry sinks. They're drawing six kilowatts every time they come on and actually heat up that water so that our water is nice and, and warm for when we wash our hands in the restrooms and, and our mop buckets and our uh, wash our dishes in the pantries. So every time those come on, we're, we're, we're spiking the, uh, the demand from our base load with pretty much all the lights on on the third floor is right around, you know, approaching uh, kind of six kilowatts. And sure enough, it spikes up almost, what, five, five kilowatts there when the demand comes on for that, for that hot water. Needless to say, we are recirculating hot water throughout all of our floors for those VAV boxes. So this was a decision that was made, again, in design. It's a lot less expensive to install these hot water heaters. Um, less piping, less copper piping that you have to run. You just plug these in. They're pretty much kind of plug and play. Rather than having a heat exchanger and using that hot water that, again, is recirculating through the floors for the VAV boxes, uh, the project decided to install these uh, tankless hot water heaters, which is a common decision made because it saves cost on labor and materials. But it definitely adds to the peak demand on each of the floors. So now we have all this data. How, what do we use to analyze it? And there's a couple different uh, systems that we're using. We have our energy monitoring control system, which is a Siemens product. We have a green touch screen that was installed in the tech museum just recently, which kind of gives um, some, a breakdown of the data that we're collecting. There's the uh, simple measurement and actuation profile that was developed within the Locale Lab, SMAP, that takes data feeds from multiple sources, not just from the Siemens systems. It takes data from basically whatever data stream you can think of. They could, uh, the Locale Lab can plot it on SMAP. And then we have our, our energy monitoring system. Again, this is a, a Siemens product here. So uh, I want to really briefly talk about lighting, and I think then I'll hand it over to Therese. So I think many of you are aware of the lighting system in this building. Where we started was a lighting system that more or less I controlled through schedules. And um, as everybody knows, a graduate student schedule is difficult to predict. So I would say, okay, at 8 o'clock in the morning, we'll turn the lights on. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we'll turn the lights off. There could be one person in the fourth floor collaboratory at 9 o'clock in the morning, and all the lights were on. So we we're wasting significant amount of energy keeping some of the floors lit. Uh, we have a couple different systems in the building. We have a watt stopper system that we're using for our, uh, our um, green millennium controls. And then we have a Lutron system that's inside of this auditorium that we use for dimming the lights for uh, uh, this auditorium and a few conference rooms in the tech museum here in, in Sutar Jedi. So again, like I said, the watt stopper system, it's a schedule-based system. It's bi-level switching, so we don't have dimmable ballast. We can either have all the lights off. There's, most of the fixtures have three lamps. We could have all of them off, we could have one of the lamps on, we could have two of the lamps on, or we could have all three of the lamps on. And by creating this interface here, um, which I'll show you in a moment, we're able to prevent people from using these difficult controls here. So these are the lighting controls that are on the seventh floor, and nobody really understood how to use them. The interface that uh, um, Andrew Kriakov and the Locale group developed is very simple and it has a few features that the wall-based controls um, didn't allow you to do, but all in all, it just it was an easier to use and easier to understand user interface. So now you can go to the, the um, QR codes that are on the wall in each of these offices. You can scan it, it'll take you right to this URL. And now you have access to in control the intensity of the lights from off, low, medium, or high. And you can control the uh, uh, a timer which allows you to have the lights on for a certain period of time and then you have to reset it. And we're working through some of those, some of those issues. Some people would like to just say, I'm going to be here for 10 hours a day. I don't want to have to go and reset my lights after every three hours. But there's some trade-offs to that because a lot of times you might not be there for eight hours a day. You might be there for four and leave and forget to shut the lights off, 
which is a typical problem. So we're working through some of these timer reset issues. But you're able to um, select the zone where you are here on the floor and say, I want these lights to be on at a low setting. And there is some significant savings with this project that um, are really exciting to talk about because the, uh, the red line here is more or less the base, um, the base load on the fourth floor before we launched the uh, Green Millennium Lighting Control Project, right around the, I think it was the uh, 14th of, of May. And after we launched the project, we collected some data and we basically had a 46% savings on the, um, on the fourth floor light load. And mo most of that was because now the users had control. It wasn't me dictating schedules and not knowing when people were, uh, were in the building or not, as well as, um, as well as being able to adjust the intensity of your lighting. So whereas I basically had the lights on at full intensity, now people can go in there and select between medium and high, and the savings just between those two settings, the medium and high, were significant, as shown here. So, so other people might say, well, wait a second, May was probably a, rough, a, a difficult time to run your experiment because, um, because, because it's, you know, during finals, and there's not that many people actually in the space. So we compared it to a couple different floors as controls. And sure enough, the, uh, the fourth floor still had the most significant reduction in, in um, load, and we feel that it was due to the, uh, this lighting control project. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dries, and she'll talk a little bit more about the uh, methodology that we use for all the different um, groups that are, that are working on this DIADR project. Okay, thank you, Domenico. Um, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. I was actually just wanted to check in. Who in, who in this audience here actually has an office in this building? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so maybe a third or so. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to <coughs> see who we were talking to in terms of preaching to the choir or not. So I'm going to talk more details about the DIADR project. Um, distributed Intelligent Automated Demand Response. The distributed part, as, as Domenico mentioned, is we're trying to really get down to the, the plug load level, okay? So, so really um, touch all electrical activity in the building. Uh, we were lucky, fortuitous, that this the project um, kind of coincided with the, this building being under construction and are being finished and, um, and very much interested, uh, that Citrus was very much interested in, in studying the building. So we were very grateful to be able to use this project. Um, on this building. And as Domenico mentioned, pretty aggressive demand response, 30% uh, again trying to maintain a, uh, a good environment for people to work. Again, the partnership is with Siemens, Siemens Corporate Research, Princeton, New Jersey, and uh, the CB, uh, SBT folks in Buffalo Grove uh, got our colleagues up at the Demand Response Research Center, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab working on this, and you probably recognize a lot of the names here under UC Berkeley. Uh, I want to talk, or I want to acknowledge these graduate students. I think, I know three of them are here, Jay, Jason, and Michael back there, who else is here. Um, I have a, the wonderful privilege of working with these, these guys, and, and it's, they've um, been a fantastic team to work with, and they really are a team, but they're dedicated and bright and hardworking, and uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure for me to work with them. I'm going to be talking a little bit in general about this project, but I'm also going to be specifically highlighting some of their work. This is not a comprehensive uh, picture of what we're doing, but at least it touches on some of their work. And so if you have individual or specific questions about some of the technologies, you might uh, talk to them individually. I'll do the best I can here. This is a two-year project. We're in the, the second year. The first year we spent a lot of time just looking Research development, just designing a plan, basically, getting our infrastructure in place, uh, some of the controls, developing the models, and things like that. And right now, we are in the process of integration, uh, making sure that open ADR communication is going all the way down to the gateway, um, integrating the controls for the HVAC system, for the lighting system, as Domenico mentioned, and, um, and, and, and adding any uh, additional sensors, uh, flow meters, and things like that that we need. Um, and additional controls. We're planning on uh, adding some additional VFDs to control the water pumps in the building to get some more uh, reduction in energy consumption. Um, kind of the big picture, as Domenico mentioned, the 
signal coming from the, the demand response from folks up, up on the hill, the, the DRAS, um, to the smart energy box. It's actually, the way it's working right now, we, we have a separate uh, connection directly to the Apogee um, building automation system, but we also have this smart energy box that they developed and that can, has a, an energy simulation embedded in it, can reach out to weather data through the internet, and so it has a, a very live dynamic um, uh, component to the control. And then the smart energy box again uh, distributes the signal to the various uh, systems in the building, the HVAC system, the lighting system, um, and the, the gateways. I'll be talking more in detail about these gateways, but this is the, the gateway to uh, the distributed loads, to the plug loads. So that describes um, kind of the big picture of what we're doing. We are looking at, although we're charged, this project is charged with reducing 30% peak demand, we um, are looking at, it, 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 so mostly that kind of day ahead slow is what we're focused on now. Siemens is doing a lot of work right now on looking at the dynamic picture. What do you do with sudden changes? How can you do load following and things like that? But we're also very interested in energy efficiency. We want to make sure that the building we start off with is a good building. And so we've spent a lot of our time right now trying to make this building function more efficiently. And then with respect to, um, this is kind of a lot to take in, but the idea here is, you know, although the, the I or the A part is um, automation um, the, for the DIADR, we also are not, um, we also are looking at manual control. What, what are ways that we can engage people in the building to turn off lights or use less hot water, whatever it is, during a bit demand response event. And this spectrum here is, is really looking at what do we do with um, the amount of data that we have. You can do demand response with a whole building meter, right, and, and with uh, full automation. But you can also do a fair amount as you get more and more granularity with respect to the amount of uh, metering that you're doing. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is at the office level, if you have one gateway that has uh, these ACME uh, power uh, sensors, that, and we have also a, a, a plug strip that can both sense power for the different things that are plugged in as well as control them. And so we can start looking at, well, how do you, what can you do with respect to demand response algorithms at that level? And then further out, we will most likely not distribute gateways throughout the whole building, but we will have more than one. And we do uh, have a simulation, Jason and Michael, are working on a simulation to look at, well, what would happen if we were able to distribute gateways throughout the building and can control every single uh, heater, fan, printer, laptop, and so forth. So where we are currently, this data might be a little bit old. Uh, I know Domenico said that the Nanolab is slowly increasing their equipment, but the, this is, and this is with the absorption chiller running. So as you can see, the peak there is about 950 uh, and the office is really just a small portion, well, a, a, you know, about a, a little more than a third of the total. And, and our focus is really on the office portion. The idea behind this project is to be able to, uh, to, to have it be a model for other commercial buildings. Yes, we're different, we're, we're on campus and such, but what can we do as enabling technologies that could be used in commercial buildings in general? And so because we have this 30% goal in mind that we're talking about, about 100 and five kilowatt reduction a peak is what we're trying to do. And we've started looking at, well, what are our, what are our big loads here and, and where can we start looking at, at getting this reduction during peak? Uh, Domenico talked about this a little bit, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but, but I'm gonna, now, um, I've been talking about in general about the project, now I'm gonna talk about different tools and the different um, work by the different graduate students. So this is actually work by, I think it's Stephen, um, Dawson Haggerty, who, who developed the SMAP system. And as Domenico mentioned, there's so many different kinds of data streams in the building that are wired or wireless or have different protocols or different, um, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, pr protocols. And so SMAP is a way of, uh, of getting all of that information into a database. And so it's, uh, it's, it's really been very useful to our project. I think uh, Domenico showed a slide shot, a slide that had the output, and I, I think everyone on the project has used um, the SMAP data from the, the um, SMAP server. Uh, again, this is another slide from Andrew 
basically describing how this system, both the lighting system and the BAS system, uh, it works with this SMAP gateway and to the internet, and so it provides this interface that we can start looking at this, this data. Uh, in terms of the lighting systems, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because I know uh, uh, Domenico talked about this, but I, I think what Andrew did was, was really remarkable. Again, the idea of distributed control and having distributed intelligence as well, getting that the um, control of the lighting system down to the individuals in the building is uh, pretty critical to our work. Um, another tool, this is work by Jorge Ortiz, who, who developed this StreamFS, and I think of it as, as really kind of managing data on the fly as it's being gathered from the individual sensors and, and deposited to a, a database. And so I'll be describing one application of this, which is in uh, what Jason's work in auditing the building using a smartphone app. This was essential to have this StreamFS uh, tool. And it's also been used in, in different buildings on campus already. Uh, this is an example of, I think, a, a Corey Hall, and just looking at how it's, it's structured, the, the data stream metadata organization. And then this is at um, looking at, it's a similar platform that you can use for Satarja Dai Hall on the one side or uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab on the other. So like I said, same, same process but different, different um, buildings that can use this. Uh, Jorge has developed this building search tool and a building uh, visualization tool that's also very helpful. Now I'm going to go into some of Jason's work. The idea here is to, uh, Jason basically conducted an audit of the, all the appliances in the building uh, back in, I think it was December, January. And, and he used this tool, actually this is a newer version of the tool. Um, I think he's involved in the, the second version of the audit right now, but he called it the rapid audit, audit protocol. And the idea is that you could, they developed, the local group developed this smartphone app where you could scan one of these QR codes. And you may have noticed that these are on all the floors and in a lot of the offices in the building. But then you can put this on the appliance and enter all the parameters for it. And it goes right into the database through this StreamFS. So that's been very slick and very useful to have this tool. Uh, Jason's also been working on this data visualization, the idea that the more you can inform people about the energy that they're using around them, right? So that and this is our test office in 464 that have these ACME uh, uh, current sensors on them. And so you can go through and you can um, kind of take a picture of each appliance and add it to the database and see real, in real time what the actual current consumption is and where it is located in, in the office itself. This is the results of, of the first audit, and you can see there's a sense of the number of different devices as well as um, the amount of, of power they consume. And so, you might, so we can start using this information to figure out what are we going to do for our demand response strategies. For example, say the electric kettles or coffee makers. Well, maybe there's not so many of them, what, 14 there, but the consumption is quite large. And so in terms of encouraging people to turn them off or not use them when um, they're, uh, unplug them when they're not needed, that sort of thing. But it gives us some sort of sense of what we're dealing with. This is, again, Jason's work showing a load profile. This is recent um, of all the plug loads. So we can start seeing the patterns of use. Uh, because of the demand response time frame, it's usually you know, between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. So you can see that loads are, are coincident, that they're, um, our high peaks are right during the time that we want to reduce the load. So this is useful information. This is another beautiful graphic that Jason has been working with. This is the month of October. The days are on this side from the first of the month to the, the 31st, and this was a, a day for which data was, was uh, lost or wasn't, uh, calc or wasn't received anyway. And, um, and this is over the course of the day. So you can start seeing, and the colors refer to how much power is being consumed. So pretty quickly you can see when the peaks are in the building. And Jason has been looking at comparing different floors of the building, see how different uh, people on the seventh floor tend to have more energy use over the course of the day, you know, things like that. So we can start looking at different patterns and trying to understand the people uh, in the building and, and see what their, their patterns are, again, so we can start developing these DR strategies. Uh, the load duration curve, this is over the course of one day, and the idea is that you, you basically um, put in order 
uh, from the highest to the lowest, what the peak is at each, at each time. And as you can see very clearly the difference between, I think this is uh, weekends and weekdays, and you can see it's just a small percentage of the time that it's actually quite high. Uh, I think that must be the night on the other side. So you can see what the base load is too when no one is there. Now, uh, going on to another graduate student's work, Tyler Jones has been looking at uh, developing a base load for the building. Obviously, if we're planning on reducing 30% peak, we have to know what our base load was to begin with. And so he's done a lot of work in trying to predict this, this base load and lo looking at different methods. There's a great report about this on our website. And another thing that Tyler has been doing is um, looking at the different systems of the building and trying to, he's, this is his diagram that he developed, and, and to try to understand the different states, the different dependencies between the different control loops to try to understand where do we make the changes and, and to make sure that if we make a change one place that we understand what the ramifications are down the road. So he's looked at both the air handler control loop as well as chilled water. Another student, Rong Sin Sin, who's um, a PhD student in architecture but also works for the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as a graduate student, has developed and spent many months developing this um, Energy Plus model, pretty extensive Energy Plus model where he took a lot of the building information system to try to map the zones um, from the HVAC system to this, um, this model. And uh, so built up all of the HVAC system, the lighting. He did it for the whole building, not just the, the office portion. Um, and I think came up with pretty good results. You can see the difference between the simulation and the measured. And this was back in April, and I know he's done some more work since then to, to match the, the fan model even better. So that's been very helpful to us with respect to trying to develop and test these uh, demand response algorithms before we actually field test them in the building. Uh, so getting to the distributed part of the IADR, uh, the idea again was to, to use these gateways to, to start controlling uh, typical appliances in the offices. I think I mentioned that they're metered with these Acme and Raritan uh, plug monitors. And now I'm going to be describing some of Michael Sanker's work. Uh, the, the residential energy gateway has been developed here um, over the past several years. I think it was a CEC sponsored project. And so the commercial energy gateway is kind of building on top of, of that technology. The idea again is to, to, to provide a means of, of controlling the distributed loads, of communicating to things higher up, like such as the smart energy box, um, and basically providing a point of aggregating all this data. Uh, this shows some of the architecture communicating with the, the user interface, which is pretty critical, uh, the database and the, the different loads. Uh, we also thought, too, that the, this gateway could be a point of um, providing a means for people to enter um, preferences. So whether it's uh, preferences on their, uh, which appliance should get turned off first, this is automated, or um, what they prefer their local set temperature set points to be, um, lighting and, and so forth. So this talks a little bit about those priorities. The idea is that each user could actually input what their priorities are for each appliance. So you might say, gosh, you know, if, if there is a DR event in this building, please turn off, you can turn off my light, you can turn off my fan, turn off my coffee maker, don't turn off my computer, or what have you. You might say, you know, I don't turn off the fan, I really hate, you know, being too hot or whatever it is. So the idea is that everyone could, could state that on this, on this web UI and, um, and then that's taken in consideration during these um, demand, demand response events as each gateway tries to meet a certain goal. All right. And last but not least, we, we um, engaged the Center for the Built Environment across campus to run a, a number of surveys on this building. Back in August, there was the uh, long survey, the more detailed and, uh, survey about environmental and uh, <laughs> indoor environmental control, that, uh, uh, quality, sorry, that dealt with a lot of different things, you know, office, uh, thermal comfort, air quality, lighting, and so forth. And you can see that um, Sattarja Hall actually did pretty well. Uh, I think thermal comfort, a lot of comments were that the building is often too cool. Uh, but acoustic quality, which I think that, um, when I looked at often, uh, the open plan offices and the private offices, and there's a huge difference, of course, with acoustic uh, quality. That, um, people in private offices don't have that issue so much, but in open spaces, that's a pretty common uh, complaint. The, 
we are also, CB is also running these short surveys as we start to do tests with the building so that we can start getting a sense from the occupants how the lighting level is, how the air quality is, temperature and things like that as we run our tests. So with that, I want to say thank you. We do have the i for energy site has a page dedicated to this, this project. Um, it's tried to die hall and it, it has all our quarterly reports and, and other slide presentations that we've given on this project. Um, and also you can look at the SMAP uh, information about the building itself. So with that, I think we'll take questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, in terms of um, transferring knowledge from your work on this building to other office buildings, I'm wondering whether other office buildings on average have as good uh, channels for retrofitting new wiring, especially from floor to floor, as this building might have. Could you comment on that? With respect to wiring, in, ter in terms I mean, of when you, when you're you're equipping a building with new new equipment and new communications, uh, you know, wiring uh, from one point to another in a building, and sometimes one of the biggest costs is just getting new wires through a building that wasn't built to accommodate them. And I'm just wondering, do you have an easier time doing that here? than in the other buildings that you would be transferring knowledge to, and if so, would that mean that you really, uh, that for the purpose of applying what you're doing here to other buildings, you might have to rely more on, let's say, wireless communication than you do here? So I think it really just depends on the, the era of the building, you know, we're talking about as if before we had these stacked riser rooms where there's actual conduits to, to run all the way from level one to level seven, or is it, um, you know, kind of um, buildings that were added to as, you know, telecommunications improved and, and they weren't designed for, for uh, state of the art. So, I mean, yeah, it's going to be more difficult. Your costs are always going to be um, the most with labor and pulling those wires from the first floor all the way up to the air handlers on the roof to, to communicate. So, there's, I mean, there's some disadvantages, I think, with the wireless technology. Most of what we have in the building, at least in relation to the automation system, is wired. So uh, we were fortunate, number one, to have an automation system that already had a lot of these sense points um, being collected. And two, a lot of the infrastructure was there within the building and within the, uh, the automation system. So I think there is some substantial costs in, in older facilities that don't have that infrastructure in place, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. It was a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you look at sort of energy conservation, right? So saving uh, sort of things that are wasted or just reducing, you know, just energy conservation versus demand response where you actually try to, to cut down, you know, on your peak consumption. I mean, if you can conserve energy, then you would probably do that regardless, right? So could you sort of comment on what do you think the biggest savings are with respect to energy conservation? And then with respect to demand response sort of from, from your work so far. Boy, it's, it's not a cut and dry line, I would say, right? I mean, in, in, like I said, we, we are trying to make the building more energy efficient. And so um, when you say the word conservation, it's, it's not the same as energy efficiency, right? So it, it depends on what, you're, what you mean by that. A lot of people hear the word conservation and they don't hear doing the same for or having the same ability and comfort and productivity for the same amount of energy, it means doing a little bit less, right? Having maybe being a little bit uncomfortable, so that, or that that can be an interpretation of that that meaning. I think um, certainly, I, I think we're shooting at a moving target with respect to our energy efficiency goals. I think that we're going to, as we go through each system in the building, we're going to continue to try to make it more energy efficient before we, we add demand response on top of that. And our hope is that, and, and we're, we're gonna still try for this 30% goal. I mean, that's our plan is that even when we get pretty efficient, we're gonna still try for 30%. We do expect that even though we say that the, um, 
the, the building should maintain a productive and healthful environment for people. We do expect demand response, they, people might be a, a little bit less comfortable. Um, so we, we, that, that's kind of an expectation of demand response. So we're trying to balance this, right? How much uncomfortable? Well, not too uncomfortable. You know, or, or what do you, what can, how can you engage people to um, withstand that? Are there things you can do, like tomorrow's gonna be hot, so you know, dress differently, behave, you know, go out of the building at certain times, whatever. I mean, what, what can we do to, to try to engage the people in the building to work with us on it? It's a good question. I, um, I, I think it's, you know, it, 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 there is a spectrum there, and we are, we are gonna be looking at that along the way. So do you have CO2 sensors? Because most of the buildings, uh, they do over is uh, ventilated. Right. So if yes. you have CO2 sensors, not only improve your energy efficiency, also you can use uh, during the demand response event. Yeah, so the short answer is yes, and that we're, we're working on it. We are conducting a test right now in the building where we have CO2 sensors just on one floor, and we're, we're just trying to learn about it and, and get a sense for uh, running the survey at the same time, try to see if people are detecting a difference as we've reduced levels. But you're right, that's one of the things that we looked at is that the ventilation rates do seem to be uh, three times is what the ASHRAE standard rate right. is. And you know, I, kn I know that there's other issues involved with there's air mixing and there's you know odors and things like that. So it's not just about CO2, but we are certainly looking at that. And uh, Jay is working on a means of, of establishing a, a network of CO2 sensors in the building so we can continue to work on this. Yeah, good point. That's one of the things that we're looking at. How do you deal with all of the privacy and security concerns in such a system? Because now instead of you go and you turn on a light switch, now you sign into a computer, you authenticate, you leave a particular record, mm. uh, and someone might gain unauthorized access to that record, and there's just a huge potential for tracking that didn't exist before. How do you manage that? So the, the, the Green Millennium interface that we talked about was developed through the Locale Lab, specifically um, Andrew Kudakov and team. That's a great question. So it does take CalNet authentication to log into the system, but you're saying once you log in in the Green Millennium database, it has your, um, I don't know if token is the right word. We don't actually have your user ID and password, but the reason we implemented that system is that so we didn't have, if, we, if there was a specific user that was abusing the system and turning the lights on and off all day long that was in, who knows, Tolman Hall, um, we would be able to at least track that and, and take some action to disable their, um, their privileges to the system. Uh, I don't have the specifics for you right now as to how we're um, securing the data that we're collecting from the users that are, like you said, logging into wireless access points or actually scanning the QR code and logging in to the system, but uh, I could find out. I mean, I could work with Andrew to get you that information. If we maybe wanna talk after the, uh, the meeting here. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much again. Terry Simpson. Thanks. 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 All right. That's fine. <sighs> Thanks, Andy. Good All right. Good talk. Thanks. I appreciate you coming by. All right. Yeah. All right, Andy.